Good evening. Welcome to PeaceWorks 2015. Justice rising from Palestine to Ferguson, from First Nations to the U.S. borderlands. A panel discussion with cross-movement activists. Thanks so much to all of you. Uh, for those of you that are in the back and still finding seats, we're just thrilled to see you here, to have such a, uh, a wonderful group coming out on this cool evening to join us. We had a great day here at Evergreen. It was fabulous group of people that you're all going to get to hear from in just a minute or two. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation by my friend Omar Barghouti. I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to have him here. I, Omar and I have met in Palestine and uh, it's just a pleasure to have him here in Olympia with us today. And uh, other friends as well. Uh, Jesse Adobe and Gabe Shaboni and Kanahus is off, I, uh, maybe with her children for a moment, but a new friend. And just a treat to hear from all of them. And we're so happy to have Sarah Altantawi, uh, Faculty of Comparative Religion here at Evergreen to moderate tonight. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking this on. PeaceWorks was founded as a signature project of the Rachel Corey Foundation to provide a forum for exploring the meaning and practice of justice and peace as they affect the social, economic, political, environmental, and spiritual aspects of people's lives. PeaceWorks proceeds with the understanding that all people share not only human rights, aspirations, and needs, but also the foibles of fear, aggression, and domination. With this in mind, we explore our own hearts first as we move forward to the world community. I want to especially thank the Evergreen Longhouse, this wonderful house of welcome. The Longhouse mission is to promote indigenous arts and cultures through education, cultural preservation, creative expression, and economic development. And we are very mindful tonight of gathering on the land of the Squaxin people, and we are grateful for this beautiful space. The Rachel Corey Foundation is proud and grateful to partner with a wonderful group of co-sponsors, uh, many of them here at the college. The President's Diversity Fund at the Evergreen State College, Evergreen Students for Justice in Palestine, and the following Evergreen programs. Power in American Society, Cultural Landscapes, Landscapes of Faith and Power in the Eastern Mediterranean, Political Economy and Social Movements, Diversity and Dissent in Education and the Media, and What Does It Mean to Be an American? Plus, we have uh, other co-sponsors, including Jerry Beans of Seattle and the Grateful Dogs Grooming and Day Camp, and we appreciate every one of them. Um, and we will be there with some of our 
our Air Festival friends with lots of goodies. Chris Hedges, the journalist, will be speaking on Wages of Rebellion at 7 p.m. at SBSCC in the Minard, Minard Center on March 9th. Uh, I know that will be a really important uh, talk. And finally, uh, on March 16th, 2015, we will mark Rachel's, uh, the 12th anniversary of Rachel's stand in Gaza. We do that with a community potluck, with education, with community building, with action. So we hope that you'll join us. Please uh, watch for further word about where and when this is all happening. I want to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Elk Tentawi, who will introduce our panel. Jews have a lesser status than Jews, 
and in which the ideal is racist and exclusivist, end of quote. That was as far back as 1967. Today, Israel is much more uh, explicitly racist and exclusivist, and its regime of occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid has been exposed to the whole world, to the extent that even US President Obama has warned that Israel might be viewed by the world as an apartheid state unless it reaches some settlement with the Palestinians. John Kerry mentioned the apartheid term in describing what Israel might become. Uh, uh, and so did former President Jimmy Carter, of course, described Israel's policies in the West Bank as constituting apartheid. Several Israeli politicians today admit that Israel is already an, an apartheid uh, state. Um, what does that mean? Are we saying that Israel is identical to South Africa when we say it's, it's an apartheid state? No, because apartheid is not just a South African crime. It was defined by the UN in the 1973 International Convention for the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, uh, which defined the crime as systematic racial oppression by one racial group against another that's legalized. So when you have racist laws that discriminate against part of your citizenry, that's apartheid. It's not just racial discrimination, it's legalized, institutionalized racial discrimination. That's exactly what Israel has. Israel has more than 50 uh, laws that discriminate against the indigenous Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel simply because they're not Jewish. Uh, in the last couple of years, the last few years, Israel's status among, in world public opinion has really plummeted. Uh, the BBC has an annual uh, poll, an international public opinion poll, the Globe Scan. In the last number of years, the BBC poll has shown Israel competing with North Korea over the third or fourth worst perceived country in the world. Uh, in fact, according to the BBC Globe Scan poll of 2014, a two third majority across Europe's largest nations view Israel negatively. So it's not just Brazil, Egypt, India. South Africa that view Israel negatively. A huge majorities across Europe view Israel negatively uh, today. Even in the US, while still we do not have a majority opposing Israel, uh, a recent CNN poll a few days ago showed that a two-third majority of Americans prefer neutrality in the so-called Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So they do not want the US government to support one side or the other. Two-thirds, that's a pretty high uh, percentage. And in fact, in, in some polls of 2014, there was a close to 40%, 40% of Americans supporting sanctions against Israel because of the settlement policy. Sanctions, 40%. So when, when people say, oh, BDS will never go mainstream in the US, how so wrong they are. It's already becoming mainstream in the US. Um, among young Democrats, young members of the Democratic Party, the percentage is quite high who are opposed to Israel's uh, policies, especially among women, African Americans, and Hispanics, as the poll holds them. Um, even among Jewish Americans, 15% support a full boycott. 15% support boycotting Israel. 25% uh, support uh, um, settlement boycott specifically. So we're seeing uh, a, a growth of uh, um, anger at Israel's policies and action to stop Israel's regime of oppression. So it's no longer just demonstrations and burning Israeli flags and so on, it's action to stop companies, institutions that are complicit in Israel's regime of oppression to make that complicity end. Um, Israel's foreign ministry earlier this year distributed a paper to its uh, diplomatic missions across the world saying expect 2015 to be even worse. The boycott is spreading. Uh, Shamtar Shabit, head of uh, Israeli intelligence Mossad for several years, uh, has reached the conclusion that BDS is the second uh, most threatening factor that faces Israel uh, today. So what is BDS in a nutshell? The boycott, investment and sanctions call was issued by the great majority of Palestinian civil society in 2005. By the great majority, I mean all political parties, trade unions, women's unions, academics, students, refugee networks, NGOs, and so on and so forth. It called for three specific rights 
without which Palestinians cannot exercise our inalienable right to self-determination. And in the occupation of 1967, which includes the wall, the illegal colonies, and so on, ending the system of racial discrimination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and the third is the right of return for Palestinian refugees. We focus on all three basic rights, not just ending the occupation, because the Palestinian people are made up of three main components. 38% only live in the West Bank and Gaza, which includes East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of Israel, and about 50% live in exile, outside of historic Palestine, not allowed to go home because of their identity. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was one of the leaders of the South African anti-apartheid movement, once said, quote, I'm not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want the full menu of rights. And that's precisely what the BDS movement has sought, the full menu of rights for Palestinians. We shall not settle for a lesser human status. We need a full equality of all other humans in our rights. Um, some of the successes, because I don't have too much time to go into a lot of successes, but I'll share with you some successes that the BDS movement has achieved in the last couple of years, which has led Israel to feel that it, BDS has become a strategic threat. That's their term, a strategic threat to Israel's regime of oppression. Um, during Israel's latest massacre in Gaza, in the summer of 2014, five Latin American countries withdrew their ambassadors from Tel Aviv. Evo Morales became the first head of state to endorse BDS. Um, the ANC and the ruling alliance of South Africa has endorsed BDS as well. In the economic sphere, we saw a lot of companies and banks and institutions throughout 2014, especially after Gaza, but ever from the beginning of the 2014 year, taking action against Israeli banks and companies involved in the occupation. For example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation withdrew its investments from G4S, a security company involved in Israeli prisons and checkpoints and so on. Um, also the PGGM, a huge Dutch pension fund, withdrew its investments from all Israeli banks involved in the occupation, and so did the Norwegian pension fund withdraw funds from two Israeli companies, military companies involved in the occupation. Uh, we saw SodaStream, a company that uh, manufactures in a settlement in the occupied territories, uh, seeing its stock price plummet very severely. Uh, and we saw several Israeli companies facing real consequences. The European Union started considering selective targeted sanctions, if you will, against particular companies involved in the occupation. Uh, and and we, we saw a lot of uh, movement in the beginning of an economic isolation. And Israel is recognizing that uh, change. But leading to that economic factor, we had a lot of boycotts in the academic and cultural sphere. Between 2014 uh, and 2013, we saw eight academic associations, mostly in the United States, adopt a full academic boycott of Israel. That has completely shattered the taboo about Israel being not boycottable in the United States. That's what the lobby and all the mouthpieces of the lobby have been telling us. It's impossible to, to associate boycott with Israel in the same sentence. Well, now academic associations have proved them wrong. They've adopted a full academic boycott of Israel, which is institutional. Uh, Danny Glover, the famous Hollywood star, became the first major cultural figure in the US to adopt the cultural boycott uh, of Israel. Artists in Hollywood are, though not yet supporting BDS, talking openly about Israel's state terrorism in Gaza, as did uh, Viggo Mortensen. Penelope Cruz, Javier Bardem, and others uh, uh, condemned Israel's quote-unquote genocide in, in Gaza. So the wall is falling apart. The psychological wall that Israel and its lobby have built in people's heads is falling apart. While they're building a wall in the West Bank, in the occupied territories, Israel's psychological wall around the world, around the world, the protective shield that's enabling it to continue its system of oppression is collapsing before our eyes. And that's something that we take 
uh, a lot of pride in participating in. Um, the last point I will mention is intersectionality. A lot of the boycott movement today is about intersectionality, cross-movement coalition building. Uh, South African judge John Dubar said, Palestine today is the litmus test for human rights in the world, just as South Africa was a couple of decades ago. Many activists, young activists, are, are, are joining the ranks of activists through the issue of Palestine, through BDS. They're becoming first-time activists. So BDS is not simply about Palestine. It's about this unjust world order where oil companies, military companies, and very anti-democratic governments and banks and financial institutions are controlling our fates. Our enemies are very connected. So it's time that we, the victims, the oppressed, connect as well to fight that common enemy together. So today, fighting for Palestinian justice is fighting for environmentalist justice, for indigenous justice, for African American justice, for Latinos, Asian Americans, women rights, anti-war, and so on, and so LGBTQ rights, and so on and so forth. It's all those struggles connecting together and bridging uh, together. To end, I'd like to quote the great Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, who said, quote, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also though those who have stolen it, is a distortion of the vocation of being more fully human. Struggle for humanization is possible only because dehumanization, although a complete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. In order for this struggle to have meaning, Paulo Freire says, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both. Thank you. Thank you, Tomar Mahmoudi. We'll just keep going right to our next speaker, who is Jesse Hagopian. Uh, Jesse Hagopian teaches history and is the co-advisor to the Black Student Union at Seattle's Garfield High School, the site of the historic boycott of the math test in 2013. He is the editor and contributing author of More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing, an associate editor of the acclaimed Rethinking Schools magazine, and a founding member of Social Equality Educators, SEE. Jesse was the recipient of the 2012 Abe Keller Foundation Award for Excellence and Innovation in Peace Education, and won the 2013 Secondary School Teacher of the Year Award and the Special Achievement Courageous Leadership Award from the Academy of Education, Arts, and Sciences. In 2011, he participated in the Interfaith Peace Builders Historic First African Heritage Delegation that brought 14 African Americans ages 28 to 79 to Israel and Palestine to meet with civil society organizations, human rights groups, and grassroots activists to better understand the conflict. Welcome, Jesse Nagopian. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, uh, especially to the uh, Rachel Corey Foundation and and it's a real honor to be on this panel with, with old friends and new. And I want to tell you that I, I first met Omar Barghouti in East Jerusalem uh, when I traveled on that delegation. And it was not long after the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, Israel, uh, passed a law that said you cannot publicly advocate for BDS. Or uh, there, will, there can be severe sanctions, right? And so, guess where I met Omar? At a book reading for BDS. <laughs> there he was. I was a little worried that uh, the meeting might get broken up and, and our host uh, 
taken away from us. But it was at that meeting um, that I think I really steeled my resolve to join the Black Liberation Movement here in the United States with, with the Palestinian Liberation Movement. Uh, because Omar told us at that meeting about a forest in, uh, in Israel that was uh, called the Coretta Scott King Forest. And the fact that those trees had been planted over a Palestinian village and using the name of Martin Luther King's wife to cover over their crimes was something that I wasn't gonna stand by and let them take our heroes from us and use them to mask oppression uh, around the world. And so I, I've been in, in that struggle and I'm proud to say that the, the movement for black liberation in this country is on the rise. It's on the rise in Ferguson, it's on the rise in, in Staten Island, it's on, it's on the rise right here uh, in the Northwest and, and at my high school, Garfield High School in Seattle. Uh, you know, I was at an NAACP rally uh, the day after there was no indictment of Darren Wilson in the murder of Trayvon Martin. Uh, excuse me, of Michael Brown. And uh, I went to that rally to seek solace and to, to try to find people to, to lift us up in a really dark time. Um, and at that rally, I, I addressed the crowd and I said that there was a level of anger amongst the young people that I was working with at Garfield that I've never seen before and a level of passion and commitment to the movement that I had only read about or heard my parents talk about as people who were active in the civil rights movement. And um, as I left that rally to get back to Garfield before the lunch period was over, uh, I had to pull my car over because a thousand students came screaming out of the, the door of Garfield High School chanting Black Lives Matter, hands up, don't shoot. And the, the size of the rally doubled and it actually was a political earthquake in, in Seattle because the media um, was right there as, as those students joined. And there were walkouts at five or six other high schools that day um, that showed that this, there's something different going on with this movement. Because young people have taken the lead in this movement and they know that the success of this movement is tied to the, their success as uh, young people in a society that's deeply racist uh, and, and deeply un unequal. And they have taken the lead and aren't waiting for everyone else to, to give guidance, <laughs> to, to tell them when to slow down, uh, and have uh, begun to change this country in some in impressive ways. And you know that the chief of police in Seattle came to meet with the students at my high school? And she said she was deeply concerned about the issues that they were raising, and she wanted to uh, lend an ear and be a conduit to change in the Seattle Police Department. There was a lot of nice sounding words that were uttered in that back room at Garfield High School as my students went through one crime after another that the Seattle Police Department had perpetrated on communities of color. And it wasn't long after that meeting that I addressed the crowd at the Martin Luther King Day rally. And I spoke about King's legacy, about those who would seek to praise him, but deprecate the struggle today, right? Those who would use his image uh, to make themselves look like they stand for racial equality, but yet oppose those who would uh, seek direct action against racism and, and police brutality, right? Reminding us that he didn't just say, I have a dream that day, he also condemned police brutality uh, in the same speech. And so I think it was only a few minutes after I got off the podium and joined a group of young people who wanted to keep the struggle going that I myself was, uh, on the sidewalk, on the phone with my mother, 
coordinating a ride because it was actually my, my second son's birthday party and I was leaving the rally to go celebrate with my son and the police, as I'm turning away, walking away, uh, sprayed me in the face with pepper spray. And, you know, it was, it was painful, but what was much more painful was arriving at the birthday party and not really having any words to tell my son what had happened, right? Not wanting to reveal to him the truth about the society that he lives in and being feeling deeply ashamed of this society and, and not really being able to explain it to him was, was actually far more painful. And you know that I thought that I was going to live with that pain as an individual and have to deal with that on my own and then somebody had a video of it and we released that video uh, with a lot of community support and we'll be building ongoing campaigns for uh, social justice and racial justice in Seattle and standing up for those who've been brutalized by police far worse than I have. But the same day I released my video, another gentleman in Seattle released a video. You guys heard of William Wingate? If you haven't, you need to Google him and watch his video. He's a 70-year-old man in Seattle. He was a retired bus driver, retired Air Force veteran, and he was doing the same walk that he'd done for 20 years in Seattle, and he was waiting on the corner for the light to change. And as he's waiting, uh, you can see in the video, a cop car pulls up, the officer gets out and says, drop, uh, drop that weapon or, or uh, drop that golf club. He had a golf club that he was using as a walking stick that he had used as a, as a walking stick every day for, for decades. And he said, can you call someone else to come mediate the situation? And she, she says, yes, I've done that, but I need you to drop that. And he says, why? I haven't done anything. And then you can hear her say, you just hit me with that. <laughs> you just hit me with that. As he's standing there, not even within range where he could have if he, if he had made the slightest gesture. But in fact, uh, there, there, he had not moved at all and not threatened or endangered anybody. William Wingate. And I was at a rally with William Wingate recently, and I'm proud to say that hundreds of people in Seattle joined him uh, at a march on the East Precinct, all carrying golf clubs on their way <laughs> to the precinct. And you know that this movement ha has really just begun, and it it's an incredible uh, force and, it, and it's amazing to work with these young people who have all kinds of plans for, for this spring and, and ongoing. And I just want to want to wrap up by, by um, talking about how important this movement is in supporting the Black Lives Matter movement because I think if you look throughout U.S. history, every time African Americans have risen for their liberation, it has ignited a mass social struggle for, for people demanding their rights across the spectrum. So it was the abolitionist movement that actually helped to spawn the early women's rights movement in this country and the Seneca Falls Convention in, in 1848 that eventually helped to lead to the fight for women's rights to vote. And it was when African Americans said, we are no longer stand our chains, that women saw you know, quite a, a bit of solidarity when it's still legal to beat your wife at the time, right? And I think it was when African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement refused to be second class citizens, refused to be the whipping post for racist police, refused to take the worst jobs and sit in the back, that you saw the inspiration 
ripple through society as a new women's rights movement erupted, as a gay liberation movement erupted, as the student, union, student movement erupted on campuses across this country and demanded an end to the war in Vietnam, and the, the soldiers themselves revolted against the war uh, where you had black troops deserting in mass, uh, saying they were going to join the Black Panther Party when they got home. That'll bring the war to an end. <laughs> Uh, and so, again, we have met, uh, many different communities in our society today uh, facing uh, deep forms of oppression, whether it's our immigrant brothers and sisters who don't have uh, justice, it, uh, just immigration policy here, or it's the still uh, myriad of, of laws that discriminate against our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and, and people all over the, the gender spectrum, and, or whether it's our, our native brothers and sisters, women fighting for, still fighting for equal pay, for equal work. Um, I think all of these movements will gain tremendously as we see the Black Lives Matter movement rise. Uh, and so I want to um, stand with you all tonight in that fight. Thank you.
prison and criminalize our people. And whenever our people stand up to reoccupy our lands and get off their Indian reservations and start claiming back our lands by building homes, by occupying, reoccupying back out in our homelands, we are given um, injunctions and enforcement orders, enforcement of court to prove how um, we have a right to be there rather than us pointing at them and saying, well, Canada, how did you get here? Where's your deed? Um, because they don't have one. And this is what happened at the, after the Justice and Lake standoff. It was a 15-month um, trial, and it and it was, um, and that's when um, my grandfather was self-represented. He went in there and represented himself and, and really challenged Canada on how they even are legally, like, legalizing how they're even there on our homeland. <laughs> In 2000, um, I joined the Native Youth Movement, and it was a really inspiring um, part of my life. And there was Native Youth Movement all across Canada and through the U.S., like Philadelphia, New York, um, um, California, in Portland, Oregon, like all over Canada, Win Winnipeg, and Toronto, and Vancouver. And young people were standing up, and they were occupying government buildings and setting up roadblocks to stop industry from um, going in. And, in our case, it was the Sun Peak Ski Resort, which is a, a massive a ski resort up in our mountains, just behind our current day Indian reservation. And within maybe an eight month period, we had around 75 arrests. We had our cabin burnt down to the ground. We had a beautiful cardboard home that we built that was bulldozed down to the ground. We had our sweat lodges, our man made sweat lodges torn down, and eagle feathers desecrated. Um, and this is the, the war that has taken place. And, and, they're, and they're waging their war with industry in our homelands, um, the ski resorts, the, the mining companies. I just wanted to like so, show a little like slideshow. Um, I think I can get some help. Um, I think it's gonna help me um, show some of the the destruction that's taken place. This is our this is our war zone. And when you see these pictures, it looks like a war zone. And these mining companies are coming into our back the back country water and it's and and they're this one mining company it's imperial metals on august 4th they had one of the world's largest tailing pump disasters that spilled into fresh waters down in bearing creeks and and lakes and rivers and when this um tailing compound broke this tailing compound was the size of um if people know vancouver like stanley park it's around five kilometer wide, three telephone poles high that was filled with um, millions and millions and hundred millions of gallons of um, toxic waste and mining waste. And it, when it went into our, our, our um, creek, it blasted through, made a little five foot creek, turned into a 200 foot big ga gash and forged into our, into our South American creeks and all that toxin went in to Quinell Lake, which is the deepest fjord lake in the world second largest sockeye salmon spawning grounds in the world, which we call it, um, you know, they're, they're killing off of a food source, and that's how they're waging the war on our people, because we depend on salmon for our everyday survival. These, um, this battle and this, and this war is, it's the, the mining and the pipelines, you know, the pipelines that are coming from the car sands and from the factory fields. These are, these are what our people are standing on the front lines and fighting. We have uh, many nations in, in so-called British Columbia, over 25 indigenous nations, and these nations are starting, are standing up and reoccupying their territories and stopping these pipelines right in their tracks by building homes and reoccupying the land, building gardens and building underground pit houses, our traditional homes, building 30-man bunkhouses to start housing people and stockpiling food because their the government don't want them there, but they haven't moved in to arrest them. As of yet, there's um, the Onistokin camp, and I'm, I'm saying this on behalf of my, my relatives that are on the front lines right now um, in major amounts of snow and, and cold, and you know, they have to take a 60 kilometer snowmobile ride to even get up there because we can't get up there with a um, vehicle in the, in the winter. And um, that's the Onistokin clan of the Wet'suwet'en people, and um, who we have an allyship with, and it's at Nation. They have a Mighty D camp where they're stopping the liquid natural gas pipelines. Um, 
there's many issues. We always say um, um, lack of freedom is the, is, the, is the issue here. That's what we're talking about. And Canada is the problem. Um, Canada right now is pushing forth a, a PC treaty process, which is an extinguishment process that people, to get Indian Act chiefs and councils, which are the civil servants of Canada, Affairs, who the chief and councils are elected and work under, we call those the civil servants. And um, so Canada's civil servants are going and trying to make treaty with their own civil servants within their own department in order for, to take our land, the last of our, our land we have left. Um, the issues that, that we're facing right now is colonization, we have the reservation system, we have the intergenerational abuse and trauma from the sexual abuse and, and physical abuse that was faced in the residential school system. I'm the first generation out of the residential school system. And um, as his uh, brother here said, it's the young people that are standing up and it's the women that are standing up in the nation. Because when the women stand up and the mothers stand up, and, and they're the ones that give the direction to the warriors on, on when to go to war, because they're willing to sacrifice their fathers and their uncles and their brothers. And, and our women are saying that time is now. That's time is now for the men to stand up and stand, stand beside us. Um, in the 1990s, we had the Oka standoff, the uh, uh, armed standoff in uh, Mohawk territory. And then in 1995, we had Gustafs and Lake standoff, the armed standoff. This has really formed the warrior movement in so called British Columbia and across Canada. It has inspired a great warrior movement. and. You'll see when you look at resistance up north, you'll see all of our warriors in camouflage. And some people may get scared of that because they think that that's our enemy's clothing. But no, everything the military got was from us. And all their battle tactics they got was from us. And um, so um, that's the colors of Mother Earth. And you'll see all the warriors, they, they, they wear that with pride. And you'll see our warrior flag flying. That warrior flag is for all indigenous people to all fly under that same flag to show that we're all fighting for the liberations of our lands and territories. Um, I'd like to always like give people also that we're not just talking about the problems, we're talking about the solutions and start thinking critically on how we're going to create some solutions here as the young people for our future. And so there's many different projects that we work on and some of them is feeding the people and growing gardens, massive amounts of food, so we're able to feed the people. We have a project going, it's called Nourish the Nation, and it's um, for my grandfather Wolverine's big farm that we are, we're going to be um, working on this year. And he's been doing this for many, many years, seed saving, and saving the traditional seeds, because that's how they're going to, um, that's how they control us, he says. They control us through our belly, because we depend on our stores, and we depend on them for our food system. Um, to create our own independence with our food and our shelter, um, building our own traditional homes and beginning to live in them and without electricity and running water and just by candlelight and, and firelight and being able to raise our children like that. I myself, I have four children. They're not registered with the government of Canada. We call them freedom babies. I refuse to have Canada give any type of identification or number to my children. And a lot of women are taking this exact same stance um, we do a lot of decolonization, and um, even within our talks, to say like we're all colonized people. Look at your history. Where are you from? No, you're not Canadian. No, you're not American. There's roots that you come from that need to be um, um, learned about, and your history, because that's how you're going to know who you are, and to know that okay, well, I'm not traditionally from here. I'm on someone else's territory. Well, is my rent due? You know, do I have to? fight for this air that I'm breathing and this water that I'm drinking on this land that I'm living on. And like you said, it was the Squaxin, I'm not sure if I'm saying it properly, but the territory here. Um, we're looking at our own traditional health care, bringing back our health systems and, and our medicines and birthing our babies alone with our own traditional midwives not registered within the system. Um, so there's like many different um, projects that our young people are working on, like said it's the youth and the youth are saying let's do this let's get this moving and and um, it's their generation and it's their generation to do things and we can only guide the young people
but they but for them to be inspired to uh, for them to be inspired by us and to be uplifted by 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 the work that we're doing. Um, I was just letting those those roll those those pictures and hopefully you guys got to look at them. But that's our current day war that's going on right now on our homelands, and we just want people to be aware of this that there are indigenous people and we are fighting. And, and we've never stopped fighting since contact. We've, we've kept on fighting and we're still fighting to, to this day. And we will continue raising our warriors so they can continue to fight. Thank you, John Alex. Uh, who else? Okay, our last speaker is Gabriel M. Shabon. Who is a writer from Tucson, Arizona, and has worked as a humanitarian volunteer in the Mexico US borderlands for more than six years? He's also co coordinator of UNIDOS, an indigenous based ethnic studies youth group. Shivoni blogs at the Electronic Intifada and Huffington Post Latino Voices. His articles have appeared in the Arizona Daily Star, the Arizona Republic, Student Nation, The Guardian. Clashy newspapers, the Chicago Tribune, and others. Gabriel is a founding member of the Ad Hoc National Students for Justice in Palestine Conference Steering Committee. Welcome, Gabriel. So that it might make it 
better, more strategic for organizers to understand how their systems operate in order to dismantle them and resist them. So we didn't have to go very far. Actually, in Tucson, Arizona, where I was born and raised, and, and where we both live, there is a, an emerging boundary building complex that we like to think of as a multinational assembly line where NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement, meets Homeland Security. And the three major actors that have partnered together are the University of Arizona Science and Technology Park, known as the Tech Park, which is a business incubator, it's its own campus, not where students go to classes, but where corporations, big and small, many focusing on border security, have offices and can participate in and benefit from the latest and greatest of research and development, or as they call it, R&D. And that's their tech part. And the other actor is Mexico, but with a Tucson-based corporation called the Offshore Group, which partners with the tech part. And they had this idea several years ago for, as I said, this what would be a multinational assembly line. And they settled on the name of Global Advantage. And Advantage was a key word for them, because when they were assessing their weaknesses first, they first recognized that they're in Tucson, Arizona, and they, and they have some tech parks, but Tucson, Arizona, most many people don't even know what it is, much less how to spell it or to say it if they see it on paper. T-U-C-S-O-N, you know, it's a very indigenous language, indigenous root, often like confuse settler populations, go figure. But their problem was, what are they, how, how can they possibly compete with hundreds of tech parks throughout North America? And on a certain level, they know, as they told me in interviews, that they can compete with the Silicon Valley, uh, or the, the San Jose's, or, or others. So they had to assess their strengths. So they, they looked at their weaknesses, uh, so now they have to assess their strengths. And their strengths are in the region, how they can, what, what can they exploit. And thanks to the uh, flourishing settler history of the, of the region, three regional industrial strengths that they have to harness, they can enjoy harnessing, are the number one border, military, security, industry, hydrology, or water power, and solar power. And as they told me, when they were assessing those strengths, each one led straight back to Israel, because they would need a first global client, as they say, to be proof of concept of their, this global advantage concept. And so they had to manufacture an advantage that they could have over all the other tech parts. And so there was never any question that Israel would be this first client for them. And so several years of establishing contacts, traveling to Israel, meeting with companies, establishing relationships began. And they didn't go public until just in the last year. And going public means getting political support, getting legitimacy, organizing a public meeting of the governors and mayors in Arizona and Sonora, Mexico, which share an, what they call an international border, occupying indigenous lands, and particularly in Southern Arizona, the Ono Olo people, uh, their ancestral lands are bisected by the border. So they have this, these regional strengths, and they all lead them back to Israel. So they begin this, this process, and they, they go public, and they have all this lot of support, and the governors commit to follow to following the lead of the tech park and offshore group. And this is how they tell me that they pitch to the Israeli companies. Uh, with offshore groups manufacturing tech parks in Sonora, although they're based in Tucson, they say to Israeli companies that they visit and that they lure over here to the 
is in southern Arizona. Here, I'm, I'm in Arizona in my head. They say to them, look, we know you use China as your Mexico, but Mexico is showing itself to, to be a, a leading player more and more over China. So we want, we want you to choose Mexico as your, as your symbolic Mexico to China. And this is why. We can offer you the, the greatest minds of the University of Arizona and the, the leading research institution. We can offer you the, the top R&D facilities in at the tech parks in the U of A. And you can come here and then manufacture products just across the border in Mexico at offshore groups manufacturing tech parks. So think of it as a, a sort of perfect example of a, the post-NAFTA world where companies that are dedicated to stopping migrants and, and, uh, and others who, who, who dare to find it necessary and needed to cross borderline, borderlines and borderlands for their own welfare. As they are ever, as these companies are ever freer to cross these same borders themselves. And where they, they pair ill-paid, the products of ill-paid Mexican blue-collar workers with manufacturing Israeli products that are being designed in the tech parks in the southern Arizona in the United States. So it's this very fateful, triangular. When a bunch of companies that share the same field, uh, and he's talking specifically about security companies, they tend to cluster together. Now they do, to an extent, compete, but to a larger extent, they cooperate and in sharing resources, sharing technology, uh, participating in trainings and, and others. And so they tend to cluster together. You know, and we can see that, you know, Silicon Valley, I said earlier, San Jose, these are places of clusters. But in Bruce Wright's mind, he's thinking in terms of border security. And there are no security clusters like that except the one that he wants to create and harness with the power of global advantage and the, specifically the tech parks in, in Tucson, Arizona. And in their assessment, he told me that they have identified 57 companies in Southern Arizona, big and small, when we're talking about Raytheon, as well as small entrepreneurial startups. And he says that what he's looking at, and he has he, he's very excited, very enthusiastic. I mean, all these um, corporate executives, that's, that's their, their whole aura surrounding them. It's, it's the sharp contrast to, if you, when you speak to Border Patrol, who are often tight-lipped and, and not very friendly. But they, when they do speak, they speak in terms of neutralizing the threat. They speak of us and them, the enemy, very militaristic terms. But when you talk to people like Bruce Wright, the intellectuals, the scientists, they're very excited and they have a gleam in their eye because they see them, themselves as providing the solutions to major world problems in which there are, there's money to be made, which is, he's upfront about. Why shouldn't we, if, we, if there is this problem about, about locking down a border, why shouldn't we make a buck, he says. So this, what he wants to do is, Global Advantage is in the perfect position to create, as he says, the first real security cluster in North America, the biggest. But he stops himself and he says, no, it wouldn't be the first. Israel really is the first. But the way that he describes it is, that as, he, as he has this gleam in his eye talking about Israel, so I won't, I, you know, I'm asking him, why do you love Israel so much? Why Israel? And he's, he'll say, he'll drop figures like how amazing they are in, in high-tech development to say that in Tel Aviv every year, there are 600 startups that just start up. And what he means about the cluster is that Israel itself, the state of Israel, and remember he has this gleam in his eye, is one giant security cluster. And that's what we have to replicate here. We have the money, Israel has the know-how, we combine the two, and and they're even more excited now because of how close they are. You know, after all these several years of creating this, what they, 
what they're so proud about, this perfected model of uh, complex building. They have uh, between 10 and 20 Israeli companies that are their first clients that are about to set up shop here in, in southern Arizona at their tech park. And you couldn't, couldn't say which companies they are because of non-disclosure agreements. But we would talk about specific companies like giant Elbit Systems and their US subsidiary uh, Elbit Systems of America, which they're actually, the tech parks are actually advocating to move that, that Elbit Systems of America move their corporate headquarters from Fort Worth or from in, in Texas to the tech park or to southern Arizona. Elbit is a major player, just got uh, in the last year a major contract from the Department of Homeland Security to provide integrated fixed towers or a virtual wall along the, the essentially the entire southern border of the United States for now before you know, these, ten, these things are expanding in the northern border, Border Patrol presence have just expanded and exploded at, at a higher rate than we saw at the southern border. So this is what's happening and this is what they're, they're very excited about. But what we're very hopeful and, and, and proud to look at is that in also in southern Arizona and Tucson, as a, not not just a, as a response, but just sort of happened, the the most dedicated of organizers and activists in the migrant justice community and movement in, in Tucson and southern Arizona, which goes back decades, and is vibrant and, and very strong, as well as the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, uh, joined forces to create what they call the, the Southern Arizona BDS Network. And what they focus on is education and uh, starting out with especially education on cross movement building before moving on also adding to actions to campaigns and targeted at projects like Global Advantage. So as it happened, both of these projects started off around the same time going public anyway and with their stated goals and now we move forward and it's a pleasure to to be able to speak about this this sort of dynamic um, this far away from the southern border of where it's going on. So I thank you all for that and look forward to more during moderated discussion and questions and answers. Thank you. What I would like to now do is actually He's my right? Has Israel, right, with this 
kind of marketing campaign. So this is like the high capitalist marketing campaign where, where reality is perception, etc. And you talk about how that's actually failing, right? Even though that's a movement that no doubt is backed by millions of dollars and the diplomatic cover of the United States, which is of course the world's only superpower. So how can it be in material terms, I think this is what I'm getting at in terms of the question, that that kind of asymmetry that in many ways BDS is really just growing and growing, how can that possibly be? And so a connection I see there with the other speakers is when Jesse, you know, you didn't really talk about this in your remarks, but we know from your biography, from your work, that you've been active against standardized testing, right? And, and I see that as part of that same kind of, we can call it informal strategies up against the, the, the formal kind of structures of society. And then of course in Kanamusa's example, it's very, stri it's very striking, which is really you have an entity declaring itself a nation state with its entire apparatus of laws, even though, as you say, the, the country of Canada doesn't actually have any written deeds that entitle them in any way to, to your land, but, but an entire apparatus of laws has been erected um, that are then used against native people. And, and you have your own strategies for fighting against that kind of formality. And finally, Gabriel, his amazingly intricate you know, kind of mechanics of, of, of the security apparatus in, in southern Arizona, you, I mean, I don't know if you really had a chance to elaborate so much on exactly how the intersection of, of people fighting for border rights and BDS actually then manages to, in some ways, subvert, somehow subvert this massive machinery. But all in all four of your talks, I see that, you know, that unlikely triumph of the informal over these formal structures. So I wonder if you can elaborate on that. Or anything else you want, but I thought I'd start us off on that. How, do we, how, can, we, how can it be, really? Yeah, yeah um, so, at Garfield High School, I think the eruption of the map test boycott is part of the legacy of why our, our faculty and, and our students feel so emboldened uh, to take action on a whole range of issues, whether it was budget cuts this year, whether it was a walkout of the entire student body and staff refusing to have one of our, uh, one of our faculty members fired or laid off for lack of funds. Um, or it's the Black Lives Matter movement, and the, the map boycott helped to ignite a struggle across the country against high-stake standardized testing. And the 1% in this country have made the privatization of education one of their top priorities. And how do they do that? How do they eliminate public schools and replace them with charter schools often run by private companies that get public funds but don't have oversight of democratically elected school boards. Like for instance in New Orleans, does anyone know how many public schools are left? Zero. They do not have any public schools in, in New Orleans. They're 100% charter, right? And so now <clears throat> that's the image that they have for this country and the way that they, get, they do that is by labeling the public schools failing. Right? So how do they do that? They first sell you a product for many billions of dollars to test the students. You underfund the students, you cut the counselors. Like in Seattle, we have no elementary school counselors left. They were, they were laid off. Um, you, you systematically underfund the school, and then you register the results with the high-stakes standardized tests. And then you say they're failing, we have to replace them with, with charter schools. Um, and so we are up against the richest people the world has ever known. Bill Gates is using his war chest to press uh, this agenda of tying teacher evaluations to high stakes tests, of using these tests to deny students graduation, of using these tests to close schools. And yet we are currently experiencing the largest uprising against high stakes tests in US history. There are 60,000 parents in New York State alone last year that opted their kids out of these tests in, in a mass act of refusal. There was the largest walkout in U.S. history of, of high school students refusing to take end-of-course exams this past uh, 
refusing to take graduation required exams this year in Colorado. Um, and the movement is poised for incredible growth this spring. People should follow it closely because this spring will be the first time that the new Common Core state tests are used in Washington State uh, and in many states across the country. And they have said they're gonna fail 60% of our kids here. That's the number that they have come out and told us before they take it, that 60% will now fail this fall. Um, we're saying this is an invalid metric, that what high stakes tests measure above all else is access to resources, not your intellect. Uh, and I think it's, if we see the coming together of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that, that um, can join this movement, where we could see a real eruption in, in society, especially if you make the link that these, where did these high stakes tests come from originally? Uh, the eugenics movement um, is actually what brought standardized testing into the public schools in the early 1900s. And it was um, courageous fighters like W.E.B. Du Bois who first spoke out about these, these standardized tests. And so uh, I think when, I just wrap up by saying that at Garfield, we no longer administer the map test because the boycott was successful and the, the superintendent canceled the test.
Sotin is really academic, is coming to teach at uh, Evergreen, for example, without any institutional support from the state or from complicit institutions in Israel, nothing in the book that will stop him or her from, from coming here. So we're not targeting uh, academics. Just to give an example of uh, how unprogressive, unliberal Israeli academics are, in 2008, four Jewish Israeli academics had an appeal to the Israeli military to allow Palestinian educators and students access uh, through military checkpoints. Because at checkpoints, everyone is stopped and delayed, and uh, quite often teachers do not make it to school or to universities, and students are denied access to education. So that appeal, written by four Jewish Israeli academics, was just allow them passage of checkpoints so that they can reach their schools. Very basic academic freedom. They sent it to all 9,000 Israeli academics thinking that every decent academic would sign that. It doesn't say in the occupation, God forbid, or in the apartheid, just allow them access. <coughs> Only 407 academics in Israel, so it's fit to sign that petition. Out of 9,000, that's less than 5%.
say that enough uh, for coming. And I really do like the idea of the synergy. Um, but I'm wondering, using the example of asking for reasonable academic freedom at the checkpoints and getting such a small uh, response. Now, that does say something about the character of that group of people. But I am wondering if there is a downside of linking lots of movements or if there's any perceived downside where people who are, there are very few people who track all of these issues. And the uncertainty of people entering into issues where there are polarized situations of, well, I need to you know, hear what's on everybody's mind so I can hear the truth all around the story. And many people don't have much of the truth, but they have some of the truth, even if they're on the other side of any movement. They have some small concern that leads them to be so strongly fearful, uh, I guess. Um, when people join movements, they need to listen. So if we're asking them to join five or 10 or 50 movements, is there a downside that some people will just not, because they're not clear on the many issues involved? I think if we could all listen to panels like this, monthly, weekly, you know, regularly, people would start to understand these connections. But does the general public, is the general public ready to sign on to a united movement. And how can we articulate the points that everybody's going to see clearly so that we can get people united broadly around a better, less violent, less fearful So just as like a community member or a common folk, what's a good way for people to actually plug into these movements? We're hearing about the campaigns and movements individually y'all are part of, but what's it like for just common people to actually, like what does resistance look like for common people and how can we like, how do you see it working in your communities with, with uh, young people cross-generational and across, I guess, movement, movements? What does that actually look like? Like for us, it looks like um, <laughs> bad as young people, warriors standing up for the land, going to the front lines. Anyway, that we all need to start action and we all need to put our moccasins on the ground, our boots on the ground, and, and really um, put that fear aside. Everybody has fear, but it's the ability to take courage and stand on the front lines because that's the only thing that's going to really create some, any type of real change. We can talk, 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 talk all we want and educate our people, but it's the fearless, it's the people that are going to stand on the front lines that are really going to create the change. And that's how I see it, um, where we're from and our movements. A culture of resistance, we use hip hop, we use art, we use murals, we use whatever means we can, we use you know, being healthy, we, our language programs, everything is a culture of resistance, everything that we do. And there's no dividing, oh, this is resistance and this isn't, no. So, Tuakaluk's a box jean, you know, wearing a skirt every day. You know, these are forms of resistance that everybody, not going to the store, oh, I don't have butter and I don't have milk. Oh, I don't need it. You know, we don't need that to survive. Like, any, all these are forms of resistance. Every act that we do should be a form of resistance. And um, for um, the brother in the back, um, we need people. We need young people to come up and help our movements. We need skilled people that know media, that know, that know how to work with young people, know how to draw young people in. If you came to our community outside Agitator, I know that's your group. <laughs> like, people will go and people will go, what's this guy about? This guy could inspire 20 youth that maybe wouldn't look at me and talk about everything that you say every person you come in contact with. And that's, that's resistance with everything that we do. Um, we need to create that culture of resistance in every single thing we do. We got a skill, resistance. Um, the only thing I would add is an example of what all the 
well we've set up here in terms of ordinary people acting extraordinarily and organizing together and the need to think creatively as, as is what gets things done you know, to figure out things uh, asking questions and then going out and answering them and I'm thinking of the whole relationship between I and my co-author who sort of did this research, volunteered to do this research as, as part and supporters of the Southern Arizona BDS Network and then presenting to the group, you know, skill sharing about what we found. And while all of us are asking, like, at the very beginning, like, how can we oppose this asymmetric apparatus and the answering process provided provided possible routes to still think through about where are the, what are the weakest links, what are the vulnerabilities in this monstrous machine, and the investigation gave possible answers. Whether it's things that are visual, the things that can be publicly uh, called out from the tech park itself as a location site for protest or resistance to going out and finding the Israeli towers that are in southern Arizona right now. For the longest time, Customs and Border Protection, which is under, is under Department of Homeland Security and is the parent agency of Border Patrol, and which is administering and facilitating the Israeli contract, paying the Elvis Systems of America, the Israeli firm that are building the towers, they were never confirmed to us asking them as journalists, has construction began yet? Because it's already been a year and presumably they're out there. But they would, they would never say, and they don't have to say. Uh, and so we went out and found, I mean, they're big towers, they're out there somewhere. So we have to go out and find them. And we did, just a few weeks ago, a friend of ours was hiking, he's a humanitarian worker, and he was hiking in the canyons and hills surrounding Nogales, which is a border community near Tucson, it's on the border, and the border wall now bisects the entire community of uh, Sonora, Nogales, Sonora, and Nogales, Arizona. And he had just read our essay, actually, that uh, came out the day before, and then he was walking along, and he saw this tower in the distance, and he's like, it looks like what was described in the essay, and so he told us, and then we all went out there, and sure enough, we hiked up this, this winding, ascending hill. There were construction workers, there were caterpillar bulldozers going up and going down, going up and going down. There were the construction workers in the bright orange vests uh, up on the tower, you know, calibrating, and, and there was a security agent there with a heavy flat helmet, camouflage pants and military boots and a sidearm and a handlebar mustache and he had a very grim face and he's like wanting to know what, who the hell are we, what are we doing there. And inadvertently the construction workers when we were casually asking, starting a conversation saying what is this and we we're just wondering what, what, what it is and, and we all were for. And they had a little conversation amongst themselves that we overheard when they said uh, should we refer them to Elvid? And then this other Foreman, uh, presumably the foreman just comes barreling down the hill and, and just like stops everything. He's like, no, 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 you have to talk to CBP. We can't say anything. But in saying nothing, they confirmed that what we were looking for. And so this it provided us another possible resistance site. And so we were just uh, populating a list of possible sites of, of actions, demonstrations. And then we get down to the creative nitty gritty about what are the circumstances that would, that would best facilitate um, acting and when and, and stuff like that. And that's what we all, ordinary people, will always, what we have to do is the only answer we know that works. Thank you. Uh, yeah, some great questions. I, I want to try to get to two of them at least. Um, in terms of the culture of resistance, it's, 
It's amazing what is developing at Garfield High School. Um, back in 2011, the state legislature announced they were gonna cut $2 billion from healthcare and education. And a, a group of teachers and I went down to the, the state capitol and we uh, said if, if no police are going to deal with this situation, um, then somebody has to call out the fact that this is illegal. Not according to activists, but according to uh, uh, the King County Superior Court judge at the time who had ruled that cutting education funds was a violation of the state constitution. Um, and so when they gathered in the session, um, a few of us were able to slip into the room and uh, unfurl a banner announcing the citizen's arrest of the state legislature. <laughs> and uh, we handed out the citizen's arrest warrants, and I think it was at the moment when I produced some plastic handcuffs that the, the state trooper didn't find it as funny as some of you. <laughs> arrested me and I spent the evening in your fun city in a, in a jail and uh, you know my students at Garfield found out about it and I get to school the next day and student yells, Mr. Hadopian, it worked and I said what? What worked? What are you talking about? And he said, uh, well I started a free Mr. Hadopian Facebook page and here, here you are. <laughs> changed the Facebook page to walk out against the budget cuts. And in 24 hours, we had 600 students march out of Garfield, and not just skipping class, but they, they produced a pamphlet that went through what the budget cuts had done to our high school in terms of eliminating summer school programs so that kids who fall behind in credits can't graduate, in terms of eliminating four years of, of language and, and science so that only the students with means could, could take those classes at community college. Uh, they delivered these demands to the mayor, um, and, and uh, it was only a few weeks after that that they spread to uh, all citywide, walk out against the cuts, and then uh, the Supreme Court ruled in the aftermath of this uprising of youth that in fact they were right, and that the, that, you know, the legislature had to uphold the funding of the schools. And, and that is where the map test boycott came the next year, uh, that collective action refusing to administer a flawed exam that's reducing our kids to a test score um, and pushing out critical thinking and imagination and creativity and, and collaboration and all the things that we actually need to develop if we're going to save uh, our society and our planet. Um, and I, just, I just end by, by addressing the this question of, is there a downside to joining our struggles? And I want to point people to what happened in Pasco, right? Have people seen the video of a homeless man throwing rocks and being shot down as if he was an animal by, by the police there? You can't understand what happens to that Mexican immigrant uh, if you don't understand what happened to Mike Brown who was shot down in the streets of Ferguson or Eric Garner who was choked to death uh, Right? And you can't understand uh, what happened to that man in Pasco if you don't understand uh, NAFTA and, and the free trade policies that push people out of their homeland in search of, of uh, a means of subsistence, right? And so uh, I would suggest that they very much know how our struggles are, are interconnected and they understand quite clearly that if they don't maintain the most unequal society in, in human history, if they don't extract wealth uh, from, from those of us here in this country, they can't use it to oppress people in the Middle East, right, and to hold down Palestinians. And, and they understand that the, the subjugation of people uh, across the world is predicated on uh, the subjugation of us here at home. And I think we have to understand that as well, and we have to unite these struggles if we're ever going to be successful. And so it may be difficult to educate people on a range of issues, but none of us is free unless all of us are.
culture of resistance, I think of decolonizing our minds. Uh, because the way oppression works, first and foremost, is not just occupying our space, our land, our resources. The most dangerous occupation is the, the colonization of the mind. So it's extremely important to start with decolonizing the mind as we decolonize our space and our resources and our lives. And part of that is shattering the hopelessness that they try to instill in our minds, especially among young people, that you're nobody. You've got to live with, adapt to the system, because that's, that's how it is, and that's how it will stay. They, they instill that in your mind from childhood, so you grow up desperate or apathetic. I cannot change anything, or I, or I don't care. I want to live my life. Well, guess what? You can't. If you try to, to do it alone, you fail. The Oprah solution never works. You know, think about yourself and meditate and do whatever. That doesn't work. It's collectivized. Don't, don't individualize. You work in a collective, you might work, uh, succeed. You work individually, one out of a million might succeed. But the majority of us will not succeed. And the second point that Jesse mentioned, absolutely, that the oppressors are united. It's time that we unite as well. entertaining a third party, 
American audiences who love to see the oppressor and oppressed dancing together, doing Romeo and Juliet together. Guess what? The oppressed do not enjoy doing Romeo and Juliet with our oppressors. We don't like it. I was in the Netherlands once in a conference and somebody said, if Palestinians and Israelis would just love each other, we will get rid of this conflict. I said, look, if a master is loving a slave, it's rape. It's never love. It's always coercive because it's an oppressive relationship. You've got to end the bondage first and then possibly, maybe, we might love each other or not. But you, any kind of love relationship in, in, the, in the midst of oppression is always rape, is always coercive. So, in some projects where there's no, in the framing of the project, there's no position against the system of oppression, there's no call for ending occupation. To give you an example, in the uh, South African context, which I was active in during college years, anyone suggesting a project involving whites and blacks in South Africa without calling for abolishing apartheid would have been rejected by the absolute majority of the blacks fighting against apartheid because it legitimizes apartheid. It's as if we can coexist despite apartheid. No, we cannot. You've got to take a position. There's no art above politics. If it, if it normalizes oppression, that's a very political art and a very biased political art. It is politicizing oppression by ignoring, politicizing art by ignoring oppression. So that might answer it in general.